Good morning, family. I can truly say family after the week I've had. I want to praise God for uh, Dave substituting for me last week, Bethany helping out, Brandon helping out. Gives new meaning to the word family. God asked us to be ready in season and out of season, and I praise God for my church family. Let's start with a word of prayer this morning. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. Just give me Jesus. Lord, I want to thank you so much for Rob and Jenny's song, Father. Lord, you can have all this world, just give me Jesus. Lord, as I present the message to you, my family this morning, I pray, Father, that it would be your words and not my words. Lord, it's a a powerful sermon this morning about the spirit of prophecy, Father. And I thank you for giving me this message. And I pray, Father, that you would just hide me behind your cross. Please help me to die to self and that your words may be spoken through me, Father. Thank you again for this opportunity, Father. I don't take it lightly, Father. I praise you and thank you for your many wonderful blessings that are new every morning. Thank you for this evangelism series we've had, Father. The lives that have been touched for your honor and your glory. And Lord, we may not see the full fruit of this evangelism series until we get on the other side. But I praise you for the stories we will all rejoice in hearing when you show us what we did by being servants for you, Father, being a team for you, Father, to reach Johnston County and the world for your cause. Thank you, Father, for hearing my prayer this morning. It's in your wonderful and holy name I pray. Amen. <laughs> Message from beyond the stars. God still speaks through his prophets. In case we're not here alone, scientists using powerful radio telescopes are listening for signals from outer space. They hope that maybe someday they will hear a message from intelligent beings on some other world. Maybe they will have a message for us. Actually, there is evidence that a message has been beaming to Earth for thousands of years now, but few are listening. It's a message from the creator of this planet, a message of love from a God who's trying to win back his rebellious children. God and humanity haven't always been separated. There was a time when mankind enjoyed face-to-face -face communication with our Creator. This was God's intention for our creation. And we will get back to that when we get to heaven. We will be able to speak face-to-face -face with Him. Amen? We were made in His image, capable of fellowship with the King of the universe. But sad to say, this relationship of love and togetherness lasted for only two chapters in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3 tells the story the tragic story of Adam and Eve and how they sinned. They rebelled against God's rules of perfect love. They discovered the awful reality is that sin separates. Sin and God are incompatible. Adam and Eve could no longer have direct communication and fellowship with God. Isn't that sad, friends? Genesis 3.8, the Bible says, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Genesis 3.8. Adam and Eve were hiding. They didn't want to face God. They just wanted to hide. And that's what sin does. It separates and shatters love relationship between God and man, and between man and others as well. 
Isaiah 59, 2, the prophet Isaiah wrote, But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. Yes, sin separates us from God, but it didn't separate us from his love. Amen? Love always finds a way of keeping in touch. God found a way of still communicating with sinful man. He chose men and women who could trust, he could trust to be his mouthpiece, to communicate his love and plans to mankind. Among those he chose were Moses, Miriam, Samuel, Huldah, Deborah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and many more. Prophets and prophetesses were spokespersons for God. This was, this was God's way of saying, I love you, I care about you, and I have a plan to help you. The Bible records many conversations between the Lord and different Bible characters, but it wasn't the same as the conversations and fellowship that Adam and Eve had and enjoyed in the Garden of Eden. Sometimes God spoke through the Holy Spirit. Sometimes he used holy angels. At other times, he used people whom he chose to be his messengers. However, the most frequently chosen channel God used to communicate to his people has been the channel of prophets and prophetesses. Men and women who spoke for God at the moving of the Holy Spirit. This shouldn't be too surprising, for the Bible clearly states, surely, now this word surely is not maybe, it's not perhaps, Surely means definitely. You can count on it. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Let's notice how these prophets receive their messages. 2 Peter 1.21 For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. God had prophets, of course, even before the great flood of Noah's day. Jude 14, Enoch proclaimed Christ's second coming. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints. Enoch is the first person mentioned in the Bible who had the gift of prophecy. But there were others. Acts 3.21, the Bible says, God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Noah, another prophet, foretold the destruction of the world by the flood 120 years before it came to pass. After the flood, we find many prophets and prophetesses, including Miriam, Deborah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and others, as I mentioned. They were teachers of righteousness. They were moral and spiritual guides speaking for God. God revealed his message, his message to them through visions and dreams. Numbers 12, 6, the Lord says, If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Numbers 12, 6. Sometimes God's messengers were instructed to speak for God. Sometimes they were to write and record a message. In fact, the Bible is the product of the ministry of prophets. Every author was a part of God's plan. Amen? All spoke or wrote for him, moved by his spirit. Through them, God sent a love letter to his children on earth. It's his way of saying, I love you, and I want to keep touch, in touch with you. And he especially, he wants us to know that he longs for the time when we can fellowship face to face. All the authors of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, James, Peter, and Jude, were all part of that plan. All had the gift of prophecy. Of course, there were others during that time who were speaking for God as well. Simon, Agabus, Barnabas, and Anna. Acts 21.9 says, The deacon Philip had four daughters, which did prophesy. All were instruments God used to reveal his will 
and to encourage the early Christian church. Of course, the greatest revelation of God's love for man was when, God, when Jesus came personally, when he personally demonstrated by his words and his actions what God is really like. Never has the world witnessed a more powerful and eloquent communicator of God's love and concern than Jesus himself. But not everyone accepted the message. Jesus was crucified on Calvary's cross for our sins. Yet the message of God's love would continue to be given. When Jesus returned to heaven, the Bible says, he gave gifts unto men, gifts which would strengthen and encourage his followers. Ephesians 4, verse 8, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up high, he led captive, captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So what were these gifts? Ephesians 4, 11 through 15, the Bible says, He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why did God choose to give gifts to the church? Verse 12 says, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. How long were these gifts to remain in the church? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Verse 13. The Bible says that these gifts would give stability to the church and strengthen the people. So they were a good thing. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the slate of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Verse 14. Notice where the gift of prophecy stands in this list of spiritual gifts, as Paul calls them. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And God has set some in church, first apostles, secondary, secondarily prophets. The gift of prophecy ranked second only to that of apostleship. So it must be very important and a necessary gift to help the church function properly. Paul likened these gifts of the Spirit to the various parts of our body. He showed that the eyes and the mouth and other parts were all necessary for the body to function harmoniously and efficiently. Just so with the church. Without vision, for example, the church is blind. Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people what? Perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Proverbs 29, 18. But you say, what happened to the gift of prophecy after Christ returned to heaven and all his disciples died? Not many generations passed until the church became careless, compromising, and unfaithful to God and his law. Jeremiah records what happened when Israel apostatized for a period of time. In Lamentations 2, verse 9, The law is no more, and her prophets no longer find visions from the Lord. As the early church adopted pagan rites and practices and discarded fundamental truths of the Bible, one by one the spiritual gifts were withheld. During the time of the, Christ, the, the church's apostasy of the Dark Ages, Bibles were chained to monastery walls. Can you imagine? In general, they were written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. The common people were forbidden to own or read scriptures. Only priests were allowed to read and interpret the Bible. I think if I took a, a survey, we would count how many Bibles we have in our home. Five, six, seven. We have lots of Bibles in our homes. A few faithful Christians, though, during this time, remained true to the Bible and its truths. Despite persecution, they shared their portions of the scriptures they possessed. They planted seeds of the Reformation long before Wycliffe, Luther, and Huss. Martin Luther and others translated the Bible into common languages of the people. Persecution came, 
but it only caused a greater desire for the Word of God. Amen? And as people began to diligently search the Scriptures, notice they diligently searched the Scriptures, old truths hidden for centuries were discovered. These truths brought to the attention of the people and a great religious awakening resulted. About this time, there came into being a new religious movement, a group of dedicated Christians. Some were Baptists, some were Methodists, some were Presbyterians, and others. They came together to search the Scriptures, and they were praying for light. As they searched the Bible, they discovered in the fourth commandment of God the great memorial of His creation. A day, asked, a day God asked His people to remember. They read the book of Revelation and saw a description of God's last day people. Revelation 14, 12, I'd like you to read it with me. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. As they continued to study, they were impressed that keeping the commandments of God involved keeping the Sabbath. They accepted this memorial to creation and proclaimed the Sabbath truth to the world. What about the gift of prophecy? Would God raise up the special gift of prophecy among His end-time Sabbath-keeping people? Would it not be reasonable to expect that God might have something special to say to this generation? Notice what He said would happen in the last days. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 31. And it shall come to pass afterward, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Notice that God said this would take place just prior to the great and terrible day of the Lord, or just before the second coming of Christ. God's people are to have the gift of prophecy in their midst during the closing hours of earth's history. Communicating with the church at Corinth, Paul made this statement concerning God's followers. 1 Corinthians 1.7 so, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation 12.17 and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So in Revelation 12, 17 and 14, 12, we find God's last day people have, we find that God's last day people will, number one, have the faith of Jesus, number two, keep the commandments of God, and number three, have the testimony of Jesus or the gift of prophecy. Revelation 19.10, we are told, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. According to Revelation, the church that remains as God's channel of communication in the last days is characterized as having the faith of Jesus, keeping all the commandments, not just nine of them, all ten, and being blessed with the gift of prophecy. Yes, God still wants to keep in touch with us. He still has something to say to this generation. He hasn't cast us off, friends. You might ask, what about the possibility of deception? How can we tell the difference between a genuine prophet and a false prophet? You know, if there was a true prophet, you know Satan would probably have a counterfeit, right? For every one of God's truths that he has, Satan has a counterfeit. The possibility of deception has always existed. Throughout history, we have seen false and true prophets. We don't have to be concerned about the false ones, though, if we know how to recognize the genuine ones. If you talk to someone who deals with money, and they, they know the difference between the fake ones and the real ones, what do they do? They study the genuine ones. They study them so well that they know when a fake one comes along, they know it right away because they constantly are studying the real ones. 
The Bible gives specific characteristics that identify a true prophet. A true prophet's message will be in complete harmony. How much harmony? Complete with God's word and his law. Isaiah 8.20 To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah 8.20 A true prophet's predictions must come to pass and be fulfilled. Jeremiah 28.9 When the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord has truly sent him. One of the reasons God has given the gift of prophecy is to build up his church. If we are, discover, we, if we are to d- discover this true gift, g- gift, we must discover the true church. They are linked together. 1 Corinthians 14, 3 and 4. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. A true prophet will exalt Christ as the Son of God and Savior of mankind. 1 John 4, 1 and 2. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Every spirit that confesseth confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. 1 John 4, 1 and 2. A true prophet or prophetess can be known by his or her life and works. Matthew 7, 16 and 18. By their fruit you will recognize them. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. C.D. Brooks says we should be fruit inspectors. Based on these texts, it becomes obvious that not everyone who professes to be a prophet of God is a true prophet. So no matter who claims to speak for God, apply these tests. If they fit, thank God. If they don't, follow Christ's warning to watch out for them. Let me share a story of how God chose to keep in touch with his people. It was during the great religious awakening early in the 19th century. There was tremendous interest in, the Bible, in Bible study and prayer. The prophecies of Daniel and Revelation held special interest. Faithful Bible students studied these prophecies and eventually came to the conclusion that Jesus would come in their day. As they continued to study, they settled on a date of October 22nd, 1844. However, 18... Uh, Uh, October 22nd passed, and the glorious return of Jesus did not take place. It was a bitter disappointment. It provoked much ridicule, scoffing, and misrepresentation. Later, after much prayer and further Bible study, the group discovered that the date was correct, but the event was wrong. They had thought that the sanctuary mentioned in Daniel 8.14 was the earth, But in this, they were mistaken. Instead of the earth being cleansed with fire, the sanctuary in heaven was to be cleansed. This involved the final demonstration of God's character of love through his people. Excitedly, the believers continued to study and began to find more truths that had been forgotten for centuries. Notice they didn't give up. Some did, but there was a group that did not give up. At this crucial moment, God chose to restore the gift of prophecy to his people. It's a fascinating story. Let me tell you it. He chose a 17-year-old girl and gave her a vision of of the triumph of God's cause. Ellen Harmon was given her first vision in December 1844, very soon after the Great Disappointment. She was shown the Advent people traveling an elevated road to heaven with a brilliant light from Jesus illuminating the pathway. What an encouragement this message was to this small, scattered group of Advent believers who later became known as Seventh-day Adventists. Young Ellen soon married James White, another youthful Bible student, 
And for more than 70 years, she spoke, wrote, taught, and counseled for God. Although the scope of her ministry and expertise is astounding, her greatest work, as she put it, was to, quote, to lead men and women to the greater light, the Bible. So she wrote, quote, Little heed is given to the Bible, and the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to a greater light, end quote. That's from Cole Porter Ministry. She championed the Holy Scriptures as the final court of appeal in all doctrinal questions. To some who were criticizing the Word of God, she wrote, Cling to your Bible as it reads, and stop your criticism in regard to the validity and obey the Word of God. And not one of you will be lost. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 18. No woman author has ever written as prolifically as Ellen White. Her messages of counsel and reproof received from God were sh shared with his people throughout books, magazines, articles, tracts, pamphlets, and personal letters. Her writings include counsel on victorious Christian living, diet, health, prenatal care, drugs, marriage, the home, child guidance, education, and much, much more. Many of her writings have been validated by modern scientific discoveries. She has been quoted by professors, doctors, commentators, and others as an authority on many fields. Dr. Clive M. McKay, the late professor of nutrition at Cornell University, stated, The writings of Ellen G. White have been cited because they provide a guide to nutrition that comprehends the whole body. Natural Food and Farming, May 1958. As far back as 1864, Ellen White wrote, Tobacco is a poison of the most deceitful and malignant kind. It is, it is all the more dangerous because its effects upon the system are slow and scarcely perceivable. However, it wasn't until 1957 that the American Cancer Society and the American Heart Association concluded that smoking was a causative factor in lung cancer. In her day, it was thought that tobacco and cigar smoke were an effective cure for lung disease. In 1902, Ellen White warned that San Francisco and Oakland would be visited by the Lord because they were becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah. This was 1902. On April 18, 1906, at 5.12 a.m., the great San Francisco earthquake occurred. The prophecy was true. The, prediction the predicted destruction did take place exactly as Mrs. White's achievements and all make her achievements all the more astounding while we consider the overwhelming obstacles and handicaps which confronted her her entire life. On November 26, 1827, she and her twin sister Elizabeth were born near the little village of Gorm, Maine, to Eunice and Robert Harmon. Ellen was the last of eight children. At the age of nine, an accident changed her life forever. While returning home from school, Ellen was seriously injured by a stone thrown from, by a classmate. For three weeks, she was unconscious and it appeared that she would not live long. Though she survived, she was unable to continue her schooling beyond third grade. Her suffering led, to her, her, led her to consider her spiritual life, and she came to exercise personal faith in Jesus. Ellen became an avid, avid student of the Bible. She attended camp meetings, revivals, and cottage meetings. After attending a Methodist camp meeting in Buxton, Maine, Ellen was baptized June 26, 1842, and she became a member of the Methodist Church. Later, Ellen and her family attended some meetings held in Portland, Maine. The speaker was William Miller, a former, a, a former army captain who had been diligently studying the Bible. Because he advocated the soon coming 
of Christ, he and his followers were labeled Adventists or Millerites. The Harmon family was convinced of the truthfulness of Miller's messages. However, after the great disappointment of October 22, 1844, Ellen was devastated. She wept. She prayed. She studied God's word for an answer, as did many of the Advent believers. Then it was that that God called her to be a prophetess. Physically, she didn't appear to be what you'd expect of a prophetess. She was a 17-year-old girl fighting tuberculosis and a heart condition. Yet, in December of 1844, God chose to, sp to speak to Ellen in a vision. In her own words, she tells of her reaction. After I had the vision and God gave me light, he bade me deliver it. But I shrank from it. I was young, and I thought that they would not receive it from me. Ellen White, letter 3, 1847. Although feeling inadequate and physically incapable of the responsibilities of this calling by God, in faith she accepted the mission for God that would last her entire lifetime. Ellen and her husband, James White, worked together in sharing the light God gave. Their triumphs and their devotion are shared in many of her writings. Throughout her life, Ellen White was a committed Christian, a tireless servant of God, and a devout mother. She was loved by her husband, her family, and thousands around the world. On August 6, 1881, Ellen's husband James died in Battle Creek, Michigan. Standing by his graveside was Ellen, pledging to press on in the work that they had both sacrificed and resent, uh, relentlessly pursued for over 35 years. Some of Ellen's most beautiful and inspiring writings appeared after this date. She worked alone for another 34 years. Her prophetic ministry took her to several countries, guiding, instructing, and counseling the believers as the Lord led her. The life and labors of Ellen Gould White closed on July 16, 1915. She was over 87 years old. She was buried at the side of her husband in Oak Hill Cemetery in Battle Creek, Michigan. A few weeks after her death, a newspaper carried this statement. She showed no spiritual pride and she sought no filth or lucre or riches. She lived the life and did the work of a worthy prophetess, the most admirable of the American succession. That was New York Independent uh, newspaper. Yes, her voice is stilled, her pen at rest, but the priceless words of counsel, admonition, and instruction and encouragement of this faithful spokesperson for God will continue to guide God's people to final victory. Amen? Her legacy to the world is a gift of love, a message to the earth from across the universe, from a God of love who still wants to keep in touch with his children here until Christ comes. Then the lesser light will pale as we stand in the glorious light of his presence once again to see and fellowship with God face to face in all his glory. I'm looking forward to that day. How about you? A number of years ago in the vast desert wastes of South Africa lived a primitive bushman named Subaka. He lived in an isolated life as a member of a nomadic people. One night, he crept into his shelter and prepared to sleep. But suddenly, the night became brighter than day. A shining being appeared to him and told him to find the, the people of the book. How could he read it if he found it? The language of the bushmen contained clicks and guttural sounds that were quite unlike the language of any other African tribe. It has never been reduced to writing, but the shining one, as Sabaka called the angel who appeared to him, had said, the book talks. You will be able to read it. Sabaka traveled for days with his family in search of the book. He reached the hut of some Bantu farmers and asked if they knew the people of the book. The tribesman was startled to hear the bushman somehow speaking his Batu language. He immediately took Sabuka to his pastor. The pastor was deeply moved by Sabuka's story 
And he said that your journey is over. Sabuka was very happy. But that night, the shining one appeared to him again and said that these were not the people he was looking for, that he must find the Sabbath-keeping church and Pastor Moye. Pastor Moye would have a book and also four brown books that were really nine. The next day, Sabuka prayed for a sign. He needed some direction for his journey. When he did, a cloud appeared in the sky. Sabuka set off after it and followed it for seven days. It disappeared over a certain village where Sabuka asked Pastor Moye, asked for Pastor Moye, and was quickly directed to his home. After Sabuka told his story to the local dialect, Pastor Moye brought out his worn Bible. That is it, Sabuka exclaimed. That is it. But where are the four books that are really nine? Well, as it turned out, Ellen White, years before, had written nine volumes of instruction to God's church called Testimonies for the Church. In one of the printings, these had been bound for, into four volumes, and Pastor Moya had this edition. Sabuka's search was over. He had found the people of the book. He had found a Sabbath-keeping people, a people blessed with the prophetic gift. Eventually, he and his family accepted Christ and were baptized. Amen? He became a missionary to his own people. Friends, God is working in marvelous ways today to lead men and women to his end-time message. Sorry, I lost my place. (laughs) The fact that you are hearing this story is no accident. Like Sabuka, you are being guided. Perhaps you've been searching for truth for years. I believe you've been divinely guided to this destination. You, like Sambaka, can exclaim, this is it, God's truth. Don't you want to join those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus? Don't you want to join God's last day people? The Bible promises in 2 Chronicles, 2 verse, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 20, don't miss this, Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you will prosper. God wants the very best for us, friends. He wants us to have every advantage for these trying days which we live. So he gives his people messages from beyond the stars. Messages from his heart of love. This is so important that he identifies his last day people with primarily two characteristics in Revelation 12, 17. They keep the commandments of God and have the gift of prophecy. Would you like to be a part of this special movement? Would you like to be blessed by this special gift God has given his people? I invite you this morning to bow your heads with me as I pray. Father God in heaven, Lord, it's a privilege and honor to pray to you at any time during our day, Father. It's a privilege and honor that you still want to speak to us through your prophets and your prophetesses. Lord, it's a privilege to know in your word that you're coming soon. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for using people like Ellen White to relay truths to us, Father. I thank you for your word that she said, was the greater light. Father God, you are that greater light. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to humbly study your truths every day and to have an open mind to what it is that you want to teach us. Thank you for hearing my prayer this morning and thank you for each and every soul here, Father. And I pray, Father, as we make decisions for you every moment of every day, that we would remember that life is precious that we're not guaranteed one moment to the next. And we need you every hour. Oh Lord, just give us Jesus. Oh God, just give us Jesus. It's my prayer. I pray all these things in your wonderful and holy and loving name. Amen.